High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Welcome to This Week in Retro for the week of September 14th. Coming up on today's show... 90s arcade racing makes a comeback. Never charge your Game Boy again. Sonic celebrates his 30th in an unusual way. The return of Gateway. All this and more on This Week in Retro. Up-to-date news for out-of-date tech. So, John, our first story was submitted by Paul, a.k.a. Hermski, who's a regular on the show now. Thank you, Paul, for uh, sending us so many news stories over on our subreddit. It's all about the 90s arcade racer making a comeback. This is a game called Hotshot Racing. It's a new game for the PC, PS4, and the Switch, and it mimics that untextured, low-polygon count style of the 90s racers. I'm thinking specifically about uh, Sega's Virtua Racing and Daytona USA, those kind of games. It includes a Grand Prix mode in which you must progress through increasingly tough tracks against seven AI opponents, as well as a cops and robbers mode. And uh, a really fun mode, which I found was this um, Racer Explode, I think it was called. It's a bit like the movie Speed. You have to keep your speed above a certain speed or you explode, (laughs) Uh, which is quite novel. Uh, John, could you be found in the arcades playing these games in the 90s, Virtua Racing or maybe even Ridge Racer? Was that your, your jam? Absolutely. There was an arcade in my local mall called Tilt that I used to go to um, when I eventually got over my fear of arcades because I was always afraid of arcades as a child. They were dark. They were a little bit scary. They were all all kinds of uh, grown ups in my eyes. They were probably, you know, 12 or 13 years old in there. And um, but when I when I finally got old enough that I was 12 or 13, I would go to Tilt at the Mall. And that's where I first saw uh, virtual racing alongside virtual fighter in sort of the Sega corner of the arcade. And and I thought, well, this is it. This is the future because I'd never seen a game with uh, drawn with polygons before. Up until that point, everything was kind of sprite based. And um you know, the, the the polygons just they were the first games that allowed you to have a fully rendered 3D environment. And it also told my brain, you know, there's a powerful computer underneath this and it's it's doing powerful things. You could sort of when you're looking at polygons taking form on the screen, you, you can kind of picture the computer really working hard to make that possible. Uh, I'll never forget when the Mega Drive version of Virtual Racing was released. Oh, yes. uh, it was it was a hundred dollars. Uh, I don't know if it was the same price, you know, ninety nine pounds in England, but it was the same price that the Mega Drive was. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a huge cartridge, wasn't it? You, you were right. You were getting right. a lot of cartridge for your money. <laughs> there was, uh, I think, there were several custom chips on there that uh, w- that drove the price up. But when you played it, I mean, it was a faithful representation of the arcade game, and it's 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 sort of a miracle that they were able to pull that off on the Mega Drive. So, um, what do you think about this 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 game, Neil? How authentic is um, this game compared to you know the original Virtual Racer or Daytona USA? Yeah, I think in its in its presentation, it's Virtua Racer that it's going for because the Daytona USAs you start to get towards more textured polygons, mm-hmm. and this is that nice untextured look. Um, and yeah, what you were saying about the Mega Drive there or the Genesis version of Virtua Racing, that was. Uh, very accurate, but what it didn't have was the frame rate, the 60 frame, frame per second frame rate that you got it in sort the of arcade. Chugged along. It chugged along. And that was the really impressive thing when you first saw these games in the arcade. And of course, you, you know, even on my low powered media center PC that I have in my lounge that I was playing this on last night, it flies at 60 frames per second because it's not trying to texture or anything. You know, this is a breeze for a modern computer to run this game. But in terms of the mechanics and the gameplay, it's spot on. It's got that Ridge Racer style drift mechanic where you can come off the throttle and then flick it around the corner. The announcer's voice is spot on. That's straight out of Sega Rally. Um, And it adds some nice extras like there's a choice of characters, all of which have their own personalities. And you hear their voices during the races, I guess a bit like Mario Kart. You hear them shouting at each other. Um, And each has got their own end sequence when you win the Grand Prix mode, which is very arcadey a bit like um i guess street fighter 2 when you finish you get a different ending for each character so it's really nice it's a fun experience and i'm especially pleased with it because earlier in the year i bought a game called formula retro racing and it promised all of this and it was just a huge disappointment it had the look but it was just severely lacking in the mechanics and the options it didn't even have online gameplay you couldn't race against other people online it was horrible 
And this game, Hot Shot Racing, delivers on all of those promises in all the ways that I hoped for originally. So um, it's a big thumbs up from me. Have you had a chance to try it, John? I'm hoping that it will be as good. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but there's a game called Horizon Chase Turbo that looks very similar to this, although it's even more stripped back in terms of its visuals. Uh, the, 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 there's, there's, there's a much lower polygon count, and um, but it runs super, super fast. And you go all over the world and and there are sort of um, tracks based on various places all over the world. But looking at this game, uh, they've they've done a lot more in terms of, you know, there's like there's palm trees, there's pyramids, there's all kinds of things to look at on the track. And that's the one thing that's a little bit lacking in Horizon Chase Turbo. All of the um, all of the features of the landscape are really sort of blocky and uh, featureless almost, Um, which I mean, it's just the aesthetic of the game. But I'm hoping that this will sort of scratch that part of the itch. And the price is definitely right. Yeah, the, the most authentic feeling track is probably the the funfair track where you've got the big wheel spinning around in the background. That's very <laughs> Virtua Racing-esque. Mm-hmm, so, absolutely. Uh, remember, it's no Gran Turismo. It's not going to keep you busy for hundreds of hours, but it's about £12 on Steam, which I think is really good value for money. I don't know what it shows up in your store for in uh, US dollaroos, but um, I think uh, you should give it a try. Um, and... I want people to buy it because when I try to race in the online mode, there was nobody else playing it. So I need you guys on there so I've got someone to race and uh, you'll see me in the lobby. Neil, have you ever been out playing a portable system and the battery just die on you? Absolutely. All the time. (laughs) Yeah. This is the scourge of portable gaming. You know, you're, you're out and about, you're somewhere where you can't charge your system. You know, uh, you're, you're, maybe you're in an airport and the airport hasn't been upgraded to have a power outlet at every seat. And, and the, the fun is over. The good times are over. Well, I'm here to tell you that the scourge of portable gaming that has been affecting us since day one might be over. Um, There is a new console out here, and this thing is called the Engage. This was developed by Jasper de Winkle, and he's a computer scientist in the Netherlands. Uh, Unfortunately, he called it the same thing as a really, really bad portable (laughs) game designed by Nokia. Um, But let's forget the name for now, because this thing is not exactly battery free, but it gets its charge from the sun and uh, the energy generated from your button presses. So it's sort of a, a, uh, a two-way street where when you're playing the games, you know, you're mashing on the buttons, that's charging the battery, and then the battery is also being simultaneously charged by the sun. Uh, this thing is shaped like a slightly bulkier version of Nintendo's original Game Boy, and it's compatible with all the original Game Boy titles. I remember growing up, uh, I had a Game Boy and I had a Game Gear. And the Game Gear just never got played because when you're at home, you've got consoles and you're not going to want to sit huddled in front of a, of a small screen when you've got a big screen. You've got things to play on the big screen. But the Game Boy got played all the time because the Game Boy could last 30 hours of life out of a single set of batteries. Uh, the Game Gear, you were lucky to get three hours of life out of that thing. So even though the Game Gear, it had a color screen, it was higher resolution, you could play Sonic on it and stuff like that. I'd never played it as much as I did the Game Boy. Um, Neil, what are your thoughts on kinetically or solar powered gaming? Uh, With lithium battery technology getting better all the time, um, does a unit that's powered by the sun or by you actually pushing the buttons have any kind of commercial potential at all? Well, look at Mr. Two Handhelds over here with his Game Boy and his Game Gear. <laughs> I was incredibly rich, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> it was the same with the Atari Lynx, wasn't it? That thing just died after a few hours. And, uh, you know, you knew it was a infinitely more superior piece of hardware than the Game Boy. But it didn't matter. If you couldn't turn the thing on, it didn't matter. And the Game Boy absolutely wiped the floor with them in terms of sales. Um This is really interesting about the button presses as well. I wonder how much energy is actually generated by mashing buttons. I'd like to know that. But, um, you know, who doesn't like free energy? I think the first example I can think of was, um, well, probably the solar-powered pocket calculator. Who didn't have one of those? You you put your finger over the the panel and slowly watch the display fade away. And then there Mm -hmm. um, there were kinetic watches. I think it was Seiko who made them, or Seiko in 1988 and that had a little rotor inside that would swing as you walked around um, and that charged up a capacitor which would keep the watch powered 
And I always loved that idea. Um, you know, if this sort of thing takes off, imagine how many batteries, how many chemicals and how much waste you're cutting down on. So I'm all for it. Uh, but I need to see this thing in action. You know, does this stuff have commercial pen- potential? Yes, uh, absolutely. It does. But only when it doesn't increase the complexity of the device, you know, when it doesn't reduce its usefulness, if it reduces battery power or needs you to, um, say, pull out a little solar panel or something like that, if it makes it more complex to use, then people are not going to do it. They only go green en masse if it makes their life easier to do so. So I think that's a hard and fast rule. This needs to be seamless and it needs to be more than a gimmick. You know, I need to see how many hours you get out of that button mashing and that that solar panel. So um, I need to see this in action before I can come to any firm conclusion, really, John. Where do you stand on it? I think you're dead on in terms of people are only going to use this thing if it's ultra convenient. Uh, when you are in the mood to play a game, you want to play the game. You don't want anything standing in your way. And so if, if you have to perform a bunch of extra steps just to fire this thing up, I'm thinking about like turning the crank on an old Model T to get it to fire up. If you're doing the equivalent <laughs> with this with this Game Boy, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, I think that this particular technology has more application outside the gaming sphere. Uh, you already mentioned pocket calculators. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. Um I, I never had a solar powered watch, but I know that those exist. Uh, there's a bunch of applications of this technology that make sense outside of something that you essentially do in your leisure time. Uh, there's crank powered radios and flashlights, stuff like that. Uh, when you're in an emergency situation and you need to perform a couple extra steps to get going, then I think that you can kind of tell your brain, okay, well, this was worth it because now I can listen to the radio and we're in a dystopian future or whatever. Um, There's also a few issues with gaming via button presses anyway, because if you're playing something like Galaga, uh, you're going to be pressing the fire button in the directional pad all the time. But if you're playing something like Pokemon or an RPG, uh, those are not button mashy games. And if this unit is depending upon you to constantly be hitting the buttons to keep it powered, then it's not going to work. I hope, I, hope, I hope there are games that come out for it that says, press start 100 times to begin. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can even turn it into a mini game. You know, there are these <laughs> units in Japan that do nothing but measure how fast you can press buttons. And it's it's sort of a competitive scene. It looks like a little pocket calculator. I don't know if you've seen these things before. Oh, no, and, no. and all it does is you press start. And then there's a button that looks like an A button on a Nest Pad, and it gives you five or ten seconds, and you press that button as many times <laughs> as you can, and then it gives you your score. That's it. That's the game. That is the most basic of gaming, isn't it? But I bet it there is. are people that love it. I bet that's really popular. <laughs> Absolutely. You wouldn't believe their subreddit. It's out of control. Um, there's no sound in the Engage, Neil, and that's that's a deal breaker for many, if not most. Um In this day and age, in 2020, uh, if you're playing a game in a portable environment, it's you're looking for it to take you out of whatever uncomfortable environment you're in. You know, whether you're on a long bus trip or a plane ride or whatever, uh, you want to be immersed in the world of the game. And when you take the sound out, uh, especially if you're playing on a little, you know, three by two pea soup green Game Boy screen, you're going to need all the help you can get to immerse yourself in that world. So that's that's a downside too. But I think you have to have systems like this as a proof of concept. Um, I'm all for creating portables that can theoretically live forever without the need of batteries. And uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, no matter if you're using a a lithium ion battery or double A's, you're going to have to throw them out sooner or later. And so that's no good. And plus you have to deal with the batteries exploding all over your boards, as you and I both know from our various exploits in computer (laughs) restoration. So the Engage is not for sale, but you can read all about it in the CNET expose linked in the show notes. I want to thank Macintosh Librarian on our subreddit for submitting this story. So John, Sonic the Hedgehog's birthday is in 2021, his 30th birthday. It's a big one. And Sega have started making plans to celebrate the fact. You may recall on his 25th anniversary, we got Sonic Mania and Sonic Forces. And for his 20th, we got Sonic Generations, which is a, a really good game in the franchise. So um, what do you think we're getting for his 30th, John? Have a stab in the dark. Uh, Sonic high tops, those red and white (laughs) iconic shoes that Sonic wears in his first game. Sonic Converse shoes, yeah. That's right. Uh, No, no, you're you're nowhere near. It's it's an encyclopedia (laughs) of Sonic, or as it's called, an encyclopedia. Clever. 
Yeah. Um, it's available to pre-order on Amazon with a release date of June 1st, 2021 at a price of $50. And it promises you can dive deep into the extensive lore and exhaustive detail of each game in Sonic's ever-expanding universe. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but when I think of lore in video games, I naturally go to RPGs. I think of Elder Scrolls or Baldur's Gate or, or, or maybe even Halo, because that has a lot of backstory to it, or Dark Souls. Um, but Sonic, how deep do you think the lore of Sonic the Hedgehog goes, John? Does it, does it warrant an encyclopedia? do you think? Oh, Neil, you of little <laughs> knowledge. You forget that Sonic's world extends far beyond the initial 16-bit games. Uh, Sonic has had several cartoon series. Uh, most notably, he was voiced by Jaleel White, otherwise known as Steve Urkel from the Family Matters TV show. Uh, yes. Um there's an entire cast of characters, otherwise known on the internet as Sonic's crappy friends. Uh, <laughs> although the, the word most commonly used is not crappy. Um, if you are into that scene at all, uh, if you're into the development of those characters and, and the whole Sonic world, uh, this could be for you. Uh, I did a quick search online. There's been more than 50 Sonic games released all across the major platform. So there's more than enough material here for an encyclopedia. If you get into, especially if you get into the actual art development and the history of how these these characters sprung into the world from the minds of the designers. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like I already need this encyclopedia to to get up to speed on that Sonic history. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're right. When a game's been around for this long, it's going to have no shortage of stories in the making of the games, the characters um, who appeared in the game as as the series evolved and the artistic direction and technical challenges. It, it's um, there's, it goes on Easter eggs, hidden extras things you didn't discover in the game. There's so much it can cover. So I am definitely inclined to agree with you. Um, I suppose the real challenge for the book is going to be what audience do you picture this out? Because Sonic has fans from, well, you know, five years old to 50 years old plus. So um, do they try and catch all of them and aim at a specific demographic? Or, you know, my suspicion is that this is a $50 book so and, and it's very traditional media being a physical book. So is this aimed at those in their earning prime the more mature Sonic fans. I don't know, but I, ho I hope they do aim it at the slightly older fans, um, mainly because I used to fawn over a set of encyclopedias when I was a kid. I absolutely loved them. Um, I can't remember which brand it was, but we had this whole set at home. And I just thought they were the greatest thing ever when I found them on my dad's bookshelf. You know, kids love a book that doesn't talk down to them. And, mm -hmm. and that's why right. I think I loved encyclopedias. So to have an encyclopedia dedicated to Sonic the Hedgehog, or my favorite video game, it would have blown my mind. It would have blown my mind. I think that um, what I'd love to see is if publishers could somehow get together and form a set of encyclopedias about various games, but make them all match in style. Half of the fun of owning an encyclopedia or any set of reference books is looking up at the shelf and seeing how they're all, you know, uniform in size. And I mean, they can be a little bit different on the spine. You know, maybe you'd have just a picture of Sonic's goofy face on the spine or whatever. But it would be so cool to have a classic, you know, a set of encyclopedias based on various game titles that all fit the same form mm. and function. Even if that was restricted to Sega, you got your Sonic, Streets right. of Rage, Golden Axe, Shinobi, you know, all of these lined up Outrun. Oh, yeah, I'm in. I'm in with Who that. Who knows? Maybe, maybe this could be a plan for the future. Maybe the top brass at Sega are listening to us talk right now, and they are <laughs> they are jotting down our ideas. But I would love to see that. Jeremy Parrish is doing a great series of books called NES Works, and he's going year by year. And, um, and I have the 1985 and 1986 volumes, and they just look so good on my shelf, and I can't wait until more are released because I'm the same as you, Neil. You know, I love a good encyclopedia. I love a good reference set of books because um, there's just something about having accumulated knowledge in a format that looks the same across the board that just it warms my heart. Maybe I'm weird. I don't know. No, no, I, I think there'll be a lot of listeners who are on board with that too. So uh, if you're interested, keep an eye out on the Amazon listing page, the link to which is in the show notes, as well as all other links that we talk about today. And uh, hopefully we'll hear some more announcements from Sega to celebrate Sonic's 30th in the coming months. Um, perhaps a game. I'd like to see some more games come, but uh, the book is definitely confirmed. So keep an eye out for it. If you were a PC user in America in the 90s and early 2000s, chances are good your computer was delivered to your home in a black and white cow-inspired box. 
Gateway PCs made up 25% of the retail business in 2004, and despite their rapid fall from grace only a few years later, they're still remembered fondly as the PC many users connected to the internet with. If you've got some nostalgia for the South Dakota-based OEM, you are in luck, Neil. Walmart has just released a line of Gateway-branded laptops and tablets in stores, which have been released in conjunction with THX. That's right, the big loud noise at the beginning of movies that makes you, you know, open your eyes and think, man, this is going to be great. Uh, That THX. Neil, I know everyone used Amigas exclusively in the UK until the advent of the Quad Core (laughs) i7 released two years ago. But did Gateway have any kind of presence at all in your country? I think we need to correct your version of history there. <laughs> we did have what? PCs. That's what, that's what people tell me all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Gateway was was huge over here. We had the black and white cow boxes. Um, we couldn't escape their adverts in magazines, but yeah, Gateway was as big as Packard Bell, Dell, or, or HP over here. They were, they were one of the big hitters. Um, I didn't buy anything, though, from Gateway. I, I was in the habit of building my own PCs by that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did buy a Gateway thing um, two months ago uh, because there's a guy on eBay in Portugal who pops up from time to time. And he's got, I think he must have a warehouse of new old stock Gateway CRT monitors. So I bought a brand new old stock Gateway <laughs> CRT uh, <laughs> a couple of months back. And when it arrived, it was so strange. It arrived in this pristine cow box as new as the day it was uh born out of the cow factory or wherever they come from (laughs) i Um, believe that was the technical term (laughs) opened it up and had this gateway crt in 2020 it was a very odd experience um and it was very nostalgic because yes gateway was so big and it was all over the magazines so um i really enjoyed that experience but you mentioned it's in walmart unfortunately we we have a couple of walmart branded stores over here but i'm assuming this is going to be a us only release Mm, that's a shame. It's a shame that you won't be able to go in and, and bask in their glory. I'm not even sure uh, how far they're going to take this in terms of the packaging. Of course, if they're just sitting on the shelf in display mode, you won't see that anyway. The, I, black, I, and white, the, the black and white packaging has to be a part of it. They can't not do you that. Can't, you can't not <laughs> include that. I mean, if not, what are you even doing here? Why did you even pay, pay to, yeah. to license this? Um It's so strange to me that people are banking on nostalgia for a brand that's not even 20 years old. I guess it is 20 years old if you go back to the beginning. But I just wonder, are there a ton of kids out there in the same way that they remember getting their N64 or their Super Nintendo for Christmas that remember unwrapping a large, you know, uh, refrigerator sized cow print box and think, boy, that was one of the greatest times of my life. I don't know if people have that same nostalgia around, you know, beige OEM PCs as they do classic, you know, eight and 16 bit computers or consoles. Yeah, I think it's all about the demographic. They're looking at a chart. They're saying, who are the prime earners? What are they nostalgic for? And in a world that's a bit scary at the moment, where can they find comfort? And often Mm -hmm. it's nostalgia. And um, they're just trying to tap into that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I I, I feel for the people that respond to that question. I find my comfort from Gateway. (laughs) (laughs) I remember seeing Gateway Country stores around the same time that Apple stores came into being. This might not be true, but in my mind, they arrived at almost the same time. And it was a textbook case of one company doing retail exactly right and the other doing it exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went into a Gateway Country store and it was... These things were placed in strip malls, you know, right next to the Dollar General, you know, right next to, to small convenience stores. Um, And you'd walk in and it would basically be like walking into a Radio Shack, which not the cool Radio Shack that you might remember from the early 80s, but the 90s and 2000s Radio Shack, where it was just a bunch of computers on shelves, uh, clueless staff that, uh, you know, were just trying to upsell you any way that they could. And when you bought something, you couldn't take it home the same day. Um, you, you had to, you had to order it and then you had to wait for it to arrive. And it made you wonder why you came to the store in the first place versus Apple stores. You know, these were all placed in really high end retail areas. They paid very close attention to all of the different out, you know, all of the different furniture placed in the store. Uh, Everything looked new and futuristic and awesome and beautiful. And um, 
it's it was just a, a textbook case of how to do retail right in the online age and how to just you know pretend like the status quo is going to get you through. Um, whatever you might think of Apple as a country as a company. Uh, in those early days before they became the iPhone company, uh, there was something unique about the way that they approached the retail experience. Now, Neil, I may be a little bit biased because I actually worked at an (laughs) Apple store back in the day, uh, way back when their stock was trading at just $30 a share. If I would have put all of that uh, money that I spent on my first Apple computer after I started working there into Apple stock, I would not be here right now. I'd be out of my yacht. (laughs) (laughs) You should have put it all on Gateway. (laughs) <laughs> might, might, might have kept it's, them afloat. You're, you're playing the long game when you put it on gateway <laughs> and uh, yeah i agree i mean the apple store experience uh, when it first came about brilliant and yes they still do a great job but they do have quite a lot to answer for in the way that other companies have tried to mimic them to the point where when i go to my bank now it's like an apple store the way mm-hmm. the way they have it set up and, and it's it's not an experience that fits <laughs> with the service in certain scenarios but that, that's yeah, another it, conversation it's even yeah. you know when ron johnson he was the ceo or he was the the head of apple retail he left to go to a clothing retailer here in the states called jc penny and he failed miserably because the apple retail model while working extremely well for apple and technology uh, was just a horrible idea when you try and translate those same things into buying you know um clothes. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. People want sales. People want two for one deals because, you know, um, the, the clothing market and the demographic of people that shop for clothes at a store like JCPenney just is not the same as that your clientele at the Apple store. Yeah. Yeah. And people want reassurance when they're buying technology, but they don't want to be followed around with someone with a with an iPad when you're trying to try on clothes and things like exactly. that. It's just a completely different experience. Anyway, we're getting way off topic here. <laughs> um, you've got to remember as well, we can't talk about Gateway without talking about Amiga because, of course, Gateway bought the Amiga, uh, Amiga Technologies in the late 90s. And we all hoped in vain that they would be the savior of the Amiga. They spent about 14 million US dollars buying Amiga Technologies. But sadly for Amiga fans, Uh, It wasn't the case because, uh, you know, they weren't about to launch a new generation of Amigas. It really came down to patents. Do you say patents or patents over there, John? We say patents, but I kind of like patents. I may may turn it around. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, if they wanted to trade blows with the likes of IBM, IBM, of course, owned many patents due to their development of the IBM PC. And so by having some of their own, Gateway could license out their patents and cross license with companies like IBM and others to bring down their costs or to bring in more money. And apparently of particular interest was the two button mouse and the drop down menu patents, which Commodore had owned all along. I mean, mm. can you believe Commodore owned the patent for the two button mouse? How did they you know, not, I had no idea. I how did no they not idea. take over the world just based on that alone? Right. Um, crazy, crazy. So um, yeah, Gateway bought Amiga Technologies for that paperwork, really. That's all they bought it for. Um, and uh, there was no next generation Amiga for us. So we should, we should like, hate Gateway, but I just can't bring myself to hate them. <laughs> it just seems like if Commodore owned the patent for the two-button mouse, that should have sustained them through whatever sort of financial troubles that they've had you know, throughout their existence. If yeah. every OEM was paying a licensing fee, because I mean, every computer except for the Mac that had a mouse had a two-button mouse. What that's that's worth some more investigation right there, Neil. I think so. I think so. Maybe that's why we all went to three button mice mm, <laughs> in the yeah, mid 90s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gateway, Gateway certainly has a colorful history and it'll be interesting to see how many customers, like you said, still find their comfort in the cow computer company. Uh, if you had a Gateway machine back in the day, please let us know if you'll be picking one of these up in our subreddit. Thanks to former Gateway Store employee Paul A.K. Hermsky for submitting this story for us to cover. So thank you for listening to This Week in Retro. Join our show subreddit and contribute your favorite stories from the world of retro. Help us spread the word about the show by leaving us a review on your podcast app of choice, sharing our Facebook page, or just telling a retro-loving friend. See you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.